30% of Caucasians, 50% of Asians and close to 100% of black people are born insulin resistant. So it's a purely genetic issue and this is the way it works. Coming through the blood vessels are fat, sugar and protein, our three major nutrients. They have to get into the cells to do their stuff. Now on the surface of every cell is a doorway that I call the energy receptor. That door opens to accept the nutrients. The doorman that opens the door is insulin. So this is how it works. You swallow food, it crosses across your liver, it goes into the blood vessels, the pancreas releases insulin at the same time, follows the food around and then opens the doorway up for these nutrients to get into the cells. If you are insulin resistant, the door is jammed. It doesn't open properly. So the only way the body can cope with that is to make more insulin. So if you were born insulin resistant, all through your life you have slightly higher levels of insulin. And as you get older, the pancreas starts to say, look, I've had enough of this and starts to fail. So the first thing that happens is your blood sugar levels rise and thus diabetes. Now a normal blood sugar level using the standard units is about 3.5 to 5.5 millimoles per litre. Diabetes is defined as a fasting blood sugar level above 7.5 millimoles per litre. So even if, you have, if your blood sugar level is say 6.5, you're still pre-diabetic and headed towards diabetes as part of this metabolic syndrome as a consequence of being insulin resistant. The next thing that happens is because the door is jammed, it affects all these metabolic processes that then drive up your blood pressure. So blood pressure or high blood pressure is a common feature of people with metabolic syndrome. And these days we think anything above 135 on 85 is considered high blood pressure. Another important point here, up to the age of 50, the lower reading, the diastolic reading, is more important than the top reading. Over the age of 50, the top reading is so much more important than the bottom reading. The third feature of insulin resistance and thus predisposition to the metabolic syndrome is what we call dyslipidemia. And what happens in dyslipidemia, it's not just a high cholesterol. It's too simplistic to focus just on total cholesterols. It's a high cholesterol, it's high triglycerides, and it's a low good cholesterol. So you can have what seems like a good cholesterol level, but your triglycerides might be high and your good cholesterol may be low, and that's still dyslipidemia, and that still needs to be considered, and that still can put fat in the walls of your arteries leading to heart disease. The fourth component is what we call abdominal obesity. And what I suggest to people, one of the simplest things you can do is get yourself a tape measure, measure around your belly button, your waist circumference. For a male, this should be less than 95 centimetres. For a female, less than 80 centimetres. And for the Asian races, probably even less than that. Anything above that is defined as abdominal obesity, and that's part of this whole syndrome. The final component is cardiovascular disease, which is the progressive buildup of fat in the walls of your arteries over decades. And again, that is the fifth feature of insulin resistance. Now, all of these things together lead to this condition called the metabolic syndrome. And it's a very common and increasing syndrome in our society, especially with the increasing rates of diabetes and obesity. In fact, we now have coined this term diabetes, which is all part of this metabolic syndrome. So that's exactly how it works. What happens in heart disease is basically this process we call atherosclerosis. Now atherosclerosis, if I just show you this picture here, this is a normal artery to here. As soon as your mother gives you baby food, which is full of synthetic muck, you start building up fat in the wall of your arteries and over decades that fat swells up in the wall of the arteries. Most people have the misconception that heart disease is caused by a slow blockage within the artery. It isn't. What happens is when your fatty plaque reaches a critical level, it can suddenly rupture a clot forms so you go from no block to a severe block and thus you have a heart attack or severe angina. And this is exactly what happens in atherosclerosis. So the key here is to reduce the fat building up in the wall years before it presents as a heart attack. So to me, the best treatment of heart disease, the best treatment of any modern disease is prevention. LDL puts fat into the wall, the HDL takes fat out of the wall. So, of course, it's great to, to reduce the amount of LDL that's being presented to the wall, 
but it's equally good to pull the fat that's already there out of the wall and, and statins don't do that very well so really all statins do by themselves is reduce the progression of heart disease whereas the bergamot what that will do is not only reduce the progression but also facilitate the regression of, of fat that's already there in the wall.